Hi, DJ. Welcome to the Sisterhood. Hey, Alexandra and Krista, thanks for having me. How often has someone said that to you? Welcome to the Sisterhood. <laughs> well, a podcast for women, I feel like I have arrived. I'm finally <laughs> accepted by the key demographic that matters most in this world. So I'm excited right now. I'm going to tell my mom after this. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'd love oh to gosh. have her listen. We'd love to have her be part of the sisterhood. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I would just want to give a little personal endorsement for DJ because I was at a conference just a few weeks ago in Cincinnati. It was called the CAFO Summit, which is the Christian Alliance for Orphans, um, which means it was a lot of people who care about vulnerable kids. Um, the name can be a little confusing because most of the people working in this space in the U.S. are involved in the U.S. foster care system. Um, there are a number of people that attend this conference that also deal with orphan care internationally. But this particular year, I think that group wasn't in high attendance because of travel restrictions and all that. Um, but I went to some workshops and of course I chose the workshop on communications and PR because I love anything communications and PR and DJ was the presenter and I was immediately like, oh my goodness, this man is wise. He gets nuance. He gets, um, what's going on in the world right now. He understands the heart of really faithful Christians who are trying to do good and trying to find good in the world. And so from that point forward, I kind of just went to any workshop that had his name on it. So um, in true Open Door Sister fashion, we just invited him to come be part of the sisterhood to talk about what it means to look for goodness in the world. And DJ, I think you have a really unique um, career path and a re really unique journey. So why don't you start by telling us whatever you think listeners should know about you and your family, and then tell us some about uh, your work history and what you do now. Okay, great. Again, I'm so happy to be on this podcast. This is a great conversation. But uh, my story is, um, is pretty you know, I can give the long version of the short version, but it really starts with my parents. Uh, I was born to my mother when she was 17 years old. And I tell most people that um, whenever you hear a story start that way, you assume that that child is gonna end up as just another statistic. But uh, God had a, another plan for me and my parents are a big part of that. My mother ended up uh, marrying my father when they were 20 and 17 years old. They were very, very young. And my father at the time was going to college. They both grew, uh, grew up in poverty in uh, the area of Hampton Roads, Virginia. And my dad really made a commitment that when they got married, he was gonna try to stop the cycle of poverty in our family. And he really dedicated himself to education and working hard. And so he actually took me and my mom to college with him, University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And uh, he ended up graduating uh, with honors. And uh, he got a very successful job in, in information technology uh, and electrical in engineering right out of school. And the rest is history. He went on to uh, be very successful. I was the youngest, I'm sorry, the oldest of six kids. They ended up wow. having five more children. Uh, and to, to this day, my brothers and sisters are all doing very, very well. My dad actually went on to, um, to own his own business. Uh, he also pastored for a short amount of time. And now he's a serial entrepreneur as he approaches retirement. But uh, my parents are phenomenal people. I'm, I'm really glad to grow up in a home that was stable and very loving and God honoring from the very get go. And so I've never known um, some of the poverty, some of the instability, some of the violence that they experienced um, as, as they were growing up. But uh, I went to college uh, undergrad at Liberty University in Virginia. I ended up playing football there, had a great time. I also met my bride there my senior year, and uh, we, we hit it off and got married very early. And uh, way from then, right to graduation, we moved to the Washington, D.C. area, and I started my career. Um, my, I really wanted, my, my plan was really to play in the NFL, but um, that didn't happen. I figured out I was too slow and too short uh, <laughs> and too fat for the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> but I ended up, my first job in the D.C. area was actually covering sports and broadcast communications. I worked for uh, several TV stations and sports journalism. 
and uh, loved that. But living in the nation's capital, I kind of got bit by the political bug and ended up trans transitioning to um, broadcast journalism and news that covered Capitol Hill and all of the news coming out of Washington, D.C. And so for a short amount of time, I worked at CNN. Um, and I also worked at Fox News at both of their Washington, D.C. bureaus that focus on covering Capitol Hill and, and all of the news coming out of D.C. And um, I also decided to go back to school during that time. And I got a master's degree at the Johns Hopkins University, got a master's in public management. Uh, and so uh, my career progressed from there. I ended up going and working on Capitol Hill as a communications director. I did that for 10 years. Uh, up until about three years ago when I transitioned and came to a public relations agency here in the Washington DC area called Pinkston Public Relations. And then during that time privately in my family time, uh, my wife and I, we grew our family. We had three biological children uh, and we also um, became foster parents uh, and we adopted from foster care. So I currently have um, a 19 year old son um, a 15 year old son, 13 year old son, and a 10 year old princess at home. Okay. So that's the, that's the quick story for me. Wow. So 19 to 10, that's my age range too, for my kids. Yeah. It's fun um, age, isn't it? it? Well, it is really fun. It's really fun because, um, they are starting to have ideas that I love talking to them about their ideas. Um, DJ, I want to go back when you said you were a communications director on Capitol Hill, um, that means you worked for uh, political candidates and elected officials. Is that true? You are on staff with people. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's senators and then there are representatives on the House side. And I worked actually on both sides of the aisle. I worked for two U.S. representatives and one U.S. senator during my time, during that 10 years. The last three years, I worked for a guy named Senator James Lankford, uh, who represents Oklahoma. And uh, yes, I was in the thick of it. Yeah, I would say a lot of people right there are thinking, okay, I can't relate. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> awful. That sounds like a lot of conflict. It also sounds um, slimy, maybe to people. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that experience. What was that like for you? And as a man of high moral character and integrity, how did you live in that space? And tell us some surprising things that maybe oh we have gosh. assumptions that are wrong. Yeah, every once in a while over the last couple of years, I have to like tell people as a disclaimer that I worked on Capitol Hill and then it's okay, I'm not gonna uh, cuss you out or, or whatever. Um, but believe it or not, long, long time ago, people who served on Capitol Hill used to talk to each other very respectfully. Uh, we are experiencing over the last five years um, a very divisive time in our national politics that, that wasn't always the case. In fact, I did a study at the Johns Hopkins University when I was a student there about the issue of bipartisanship over the last 50 years. Actually, I went back 70 years. And what I found out is that bipartisanship uh, through the 40s and 50s and 60s um, were, was always something that was very normal. It was very collegial, it was very civil, all of those things. And we saw a decline of bipartisanship with the introduction of every new medium, news mm. medium. And so 1979, you, you guys may not know, what was the big invention of that time in media? You guys know? No. I, I don't expect you to know, C-SPAN. Uh, C-SPAN <laughs> oh, was created in 1979. And at the time before that it was created, certain members of Congress were actually warning that no, if we, if we have media and TV cameras and stuff like that, attending hearings and attending our deliberation, then it's going to become more divisive and uh, critical and people are gonna play to the media uh, when they should be trying to work together um, with, their, with their colleagues. And lo and behold, they ended up doing it uh, in a display of transparency. And there are, we, we also see over the next three decades, bipartisanship decreases with the introduction of a new news media. So cable news with CNN in the 1980s, late 1980s was a big one. You saw it change there. Uh, you saw other cable news outlets as well uh, throughout the early 90s. Uh, you saw the expansion of the internet and internet news. 
Uh, and then in the 2000s, you saw blogs were a big thing, political blogs. Mm -hmm. And then in the 210s, over the last um, uh, probably 12 years or so, social media has just erupted and has become this other disruptive force in politics. And, and that's why we see now, you know, so, so, so much divisiveness in this town. And everybody uh, has a voice, right? Uh, before, if you look at 20 years ago, you couldn't get a group of a small group of loud people together to make so much noise, but now you can. And oftentimes mm -hmm. some politicians will actually play to those, uh, to those groups. But I have good news for you though. It is okay. not all doom and gloom. Uh, this town is full of really, really good people who are here to do great work. And I would even tell you that the majority of people who work on Capitol Hill and in the federal agencies and at the White House and at different places uh, all across Washington, D.C. and our federal government are phenomenal people who are focused on public service. Now, the media will hardly ever pay attention to those people because it doesn't sell. I mean, just think about it. There are 435 representatives in the House of Representatives, right? And on our news, we often see maybe 40 of them, okay? So it's kind of the loudest group, uh, sometimes the elected officials that get attention. Same for the Senate, there's 100 senators. But how many of them do you know by name? Mm -hmm. Most of them, you have no idea who they are. Um, and so it's not the majority that are oftentimes with the most caustic and nasty statements and social media posts. There's actually a lot of bipartisanship and collaboration happening. Now, the bipartisanship is nowhere near where it used to be 30, 40 decades ago, but there still is a lot of it and they work together. And in fact, um, there are even Bible studies that take place on Capitol Hill where uh, the people from both parties will actually attend. Uh, um, chaplain of uh, the chaplain of the U.S. Senate, Chaplain Barry Black, actually leads a bipartisan breakfast um, that he has once a, a week while Congress is in session, where people from both parties will come together and actually break bread together, and they are very kind to each other, and so on and so on. So most oh my people gosh. never see that. Good news. I'm glad to tell you that that. that could <laughs> That is good news because even the National Prayer Be Breakfast, I feel like, has become a political weapon. And um, so we, I think, intuitively hope that those behind the scenes stories are happening. So it's good to have a voice telling us that yeah. that's true. Um, how would you say for the average person who isn't in Washington, how, how would you suggest that person goes to look for good in the political sphere? Maybe it's local, but maybe on the national level. Yeah, first of all, I would say, I really encourage people that are discouraged by the political climate in DC um, to be very, very judicious about the news that you consume. Be very, very judicious about the social media that you consume. Oftentimes I'll hear from people who are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe all this is happening in DC. You know, our world is coming to an end, our national is coming to an end. Sometimes I'll ask them, where have you been getting your news lately? What have you been watching? How much time do you spend on Twitter? And almost always you'll hear a correlation of someone who has a really high consumption level of those things. And I will encourage them, if they are a follower of Jesus like I am, I will encourage them to actually do a fast, a fast of a, for a week of not watching any cable news and not being on Twitter or anything like that. And most of the time, you know, you will see a change in even how they feel, tone, their spirit, all of those things um, are really, really healthy um, for, for people to, to experience. And so I would encourage, um, sometimes you need to step away mm -hmm. uh, in order to just, uh, I guess, have a more healthier view of politics and government and things like that. Uh, in, in regards to what you do consume, um, I would encourage people to check out their local news a little bit more than the national news. Local affiliates oftentimes are gonna be more based on fact and they're gonna tell you the truth. Um, there are still good news outlets that are uh, a little bit um, less un unbiased. Um, media outlets like Reuters, uh, media outlets like the Associated Press. Um, now, I think many reporters who work here would tell you that Everybody has a little bit of a bias, but most of the time with those media outlets, it's not gonna be 
um, it's not going to be nearly as uh, biased as a lot of opinion journalism that are, is out there today. I was just thinking about as you're even sharing all of these different pieces that the further we get away from human to human contact, the more divisive it becomes. And so even like with you recommending, okay, do a, do a fast, do a social media fast, that's forcing people into the real world and out of the virtual world, right? Where they can have more like human to human interaction. So what would you say is, are some things that you do even in your work and your life to keep that? Because as I was thinking about, you know, this day, back when you were talking what 79 where you actually had people who were respectful and having dialogue and there was this you know just mutual kindness that was just baseline that actually we don't really see anymore and so i mean what are some ways that you encourage that kind of just baseline kindness and human interaction in your work well, in my work, um, I work in public relations. So I work with media and I work with organizations pretty often. And I will tell you, there are some media reporters that we work with on a regular basis who are looking for good news stories. Um, and I wanna really convey to people is that the news media at the end of the day is a business. They actually have to sell advertising. They have to get online traffic. They have to get viewership. They have to get higher ratings in order to continue. And so, they are delivering what our culture wants. Mm -hmm. They are delivering what our culture wants. And so if we want a change, then we need to change our media consumption. So find a different media outlet that doesn't have as much opinion journalism. And we're over time, you're gonna see better ratings there. PBS NewsHour is one. Mm -hmm. um, that is an evening show with Dude, Judy Woodruff. She, she tries really hard to be unbiased. If her ratings went up, everybody else would watch, would see that, and they would ultimately uh, adjust their 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 own programming. And the cable news outlets, um, opinion journalism themselves, and that's why all of them have actually increased over the last five to ten years, not decreased. They've increased it because that's what the, the public want. I'll say this other thing too: um, people often look at Washington D.C. and say, only if we um, elected these type of people to go to Washington, D.C., then they would change the, the country. That's, that's not the way that our country works. It's the other way around. Washington, D.C. is a reflection of the country, not the other way around. Yeah. And so if we, if we really care about the people that we're trying to elect, if we see the culture there, um, you, you got to look at yourself and say, oh, this really is what our country is. And so it's going to have to be a grassroots level of engagement that's going to change what we see in Washington, D.C. and change what our what our politics are. You know, it won't change until we demand it. Um, one organization that's a political organization uh, that I uh, do a lot of work with is called the AND Campaign, A-N-D Campaign. My good mm -hmm. friend Justin Gibney is the president of the organization. And they're really trying to bring a, a new type of political engagement to Christianity in our work, Walk with Jesus. And he opens up his podcast uh, every, every time, every show, he says, I don't want you to think like a Republican. Don't think like a Democrat. Think like a Christian. That is the most important identity that we all have. And so that should actually shape how we view politics and how we do politics as well. Mm hmm. I'm a huge fan of the AND campaign. So that's they great. just opened a Denver chapter. I'm in Denver. Um, oh, I should say we opened a Denver chapter. I'm part of the group. So okay, uh, I need to take ownership. <laughs> I need to take ownership. I mean, I'm, I went to the opening. That's how I'm taking ownership. Um, but I think they do a beautiful job. And I do try to point to them a lot because they do a beautiful job of saying, this is what we value as people of faith. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to lead in the public square with what we value. And uh, leaders will rise to the top or rise to um, the ballot, I guess, if we say this is what we value as people. Um, yeah, and I would even encourage people who are really concerned about this, start getting involved at a local level and start asking your elected leaders and the candidates, what is their view of civility? Ask them straight up, what is your view of civility and politics? And ask them, how are you going to engage with people of the other political party? Um, are you going to attack them or are you just going to 
point out where you disagree on politics. There's a difference between criticizing people and criticizing their policy. That's a huge difference. Huge. And if we had a groundswell of people across the country who began to demand that and ask that of their elected officials, we would change, we see a change overnight. Because politicians, I mean, they are elected leaders are oftentimes um, that, you know, they care about what their constituents think. And if they start to hear that more and more, they will know that we're out here. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. I love it. Um, okay. I want to shift a little bit to talk about the work that you do now, because um, you work with a lot of national ministries, uh, ministries that uh, a lot of our listeners are big fans of and are involved in. And um, I think a lot of uh, Christians right now feel like we don't know where we fit in the larger culture. And so we're watching some ministries that we care about uh, figure out how, where they fit as cultural norms are shifting and changing. How do they continue with their mission? Often it's of evangelism or maybe caring for the poor, caring for the vulnerable. What challenges do you see as ministries are moving forward? Maybe my husband runs a local little ministry here in Denver. So big or small, what do you see culturally that is a challenge? And then how do you see ministries responding in a way that's good, that shows um, Christian faithfulness in a really positive way that's not combative? That's a great question. We are really entering into a new society, a new part of our American culture that many Christians have never experienced in their entire life. And that's with the decline of practicing Christianity, uh, we're going to see more and more pressure on a lot of our Christian ministries. Uh, it's, it's just the fact of the matter, it's going to be that way. If we look to a lot of other countries that are maybe post-Christian or have a, a lower level of religiosity, religiosity, you've already seen that over the last decade or so. And I think American Christians could really do ourselves a favor by actually looking at what Christians are doing in other parts of the country. Oftentimes, Americans, we are so consumed with what, you know, is around us, and we think we're the center of the universe. We're not. Um, but if you look at Christians in Asia, you look at Christians in Europe, you look at Christians in other parts of the world, and many of them may be the minority, but they are yet thriving. And so um, in America, it's, it's going to be a tough transition, and many organizations are already feeling that because of the principles and the values that they hold are truly becoming countercultural. And uh, the knee-jerk reaction for many Christian ministries is to kind of retreat, uh, either to retreat or have a conversation about whether or not they need to change their values and things like that. Um, I, would, I would say that's, that shouldn't be the first step. I, I would encourage Christian ministries to think about very uh, closely how they engage culture and specifically, how do they appeal and engage the people who are not followers of Jesus? Um, how do you actually gain credibility and trust with people who are not Christians? Uh, that will that will that should that really should be something that a lot of organizations um, are asking themselves. Um, and are we truly reflecting um, the Jesus of Naz Nazareth that we worship? If we thought about Jesus's time on the earth and we looked at the people that he hung out with, okay, we're talking about you know the disciples and so on, but he hung out with sinners. He hung out with people who were not believers. And I believe if Jesus walked the earth today, he'd be hanging out with people that we might be surprised. And, and so I ask ourselves that question as Christian leaders um, or uh, Christians themselves or ministries, is like, who are you appealing to right now? And is it possible to appeal to people who think differently? I think it is, especially when you serve them. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are serving the community, it is breaking down so many different walls and people have a completely different approach. And so I won't talk about all of the uh, ministries that my uh, PR agency works with, but I'll just name a few organizations that are doing a really phenomenal job. Um, two of them are Prison Fellowship. Uh, they're a ministry that serves people who are in prisons and their family. Uh, and then also InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, which is a college campus ministry uh, based in Wisconsin. One thing that both of these organizations have done have really put a different focus on engaging culture from a justice perspective. They are a very loud voice when it comes to trying to right various wrongs, whether it's racially, whether it's criminal justice reform, whether it's advocating for redemption, 
uh, those things. And because of that, they have been able to appeal to non-Christians. People are looking at them like, you know what? I don't know if I agree with everything that you believe, mm-hmm. but I can respect, you know, the way that you serve and I can respect that, that you're here and you have a presence in these spaces. You're not sitting up on your ivory tower in churches, uh, just judging everybody. And so um, I think those two organizations do a really phenomenal job of engaging the culture. It reminds me of Jeff Henderson's book, Four. Have you ever heard Jeff Henderson speak? I have heard him speak. I haven't read the book though. Yeah, it's phenomenal. But his whole positioning is let's be known for what we're for rather than against. And so, you know, he, he even had a hashtag that was like for Gwinnett, which was that their city. Right. And then everyone's like, well, what's for Gwinnett? I want to be for Gwinnett, whatever that is. But I feel like that's what you're speaking to. It's this idea that you're, when you're so for people, I mean, how can they be against someone who is for them, who is literally like in their corner with them. Like you don't fight people that are in your corner, loving you and serving you. So that's really beautiful. I'm wondering if any, like even specific stories from your own life come to mind where you've seen some of that happen or even something you've witnessed. Oh man, there's so many stories in my lifetime where I've seen that. Um, I've been a part of uh, a church here locally in the Washington DC area called McLean Bible Church. Uh, David Platt is the pastor. Mm-hmm. And last year during the pandemic, they served, um, it's a ridiculous number. I don't even want to try to make it up, but I'll be like, you know, millions of pounds of food just served and served families who were struggling during the pandemic. And it was amazing to see their perception in the community because oftentimes McLean was considered, it's in a part of the part of the city, part of the area that's very wealthy. Um, and they were like, oh, okay, you know, McLean Bible, we know who you are over there, all you rich people and stuff like that. But they actually left the, the church and the facility and they went into the neighborhood and they went into a lot of neighborhoods that are not considered safe in this city. They went to places where you often don't see Christian leaders and it has really, really impacted the way that they're perceived uh, and their brand to use a PR terminology Mm -hmm. is that they love people and they're for people and they're gonna use the resources that God has given them uh, to to bless others. Well, that's not a surprise with David Platt, right? I mean, he calls people to live the life that they uh, profess to live and uh, really wants that to be as little space as possible between what you say and what you are actually doing with your actions. So if anybody wants to be challenged, I would say read a David Platt book or listen to one of his sermons. Um, Mm -hmm. I talk in my book that comes out in a week about um, doing what is right or what is just. And um, that can often be costly. And I talk about moral courage in the book do you have a story of where you've seen someone who's willing to take on um, a cost of some type because they were standing up for something that they thought was right? Yeah, I mean, I automatically think back to the civil rights movement and many of the leaders of that movement during the 60s and 70s stood up for racial equality um, because they truly believed in it. And they were willing to give their life. And we know Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King's story, but there are so many unsung heroes during that period of time as well, um, who, who also did that thing. Like Fannie Lou Hamer is a, is a woman who during the 70s and 80s was a strong advocate for the civil rights movement. And her conviction came from her faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, she really conveyed that everyone is created in the image of God, no matter their wealth, their background, and their skin color. And she was scrutinized in the public so, so much, so much. And uh, I think it's interesting that over the last 10 years, she's really gotten her due. Her due. She's passed away since. But um, there's now a, there's a portrait in the Capitol building of her. Uh, there's a couple of statues being built uh, as well to honor the service that she uh, gave and she was an elected official um, later in her life as well. She was actually elected. Uh, So similar to John Lewis in some way, John Lewis was elected um, very early on, I believe in his thirties, 
but Fannie Lou Hamer wasn't elected until later on. And even then, she was not even a popular elected official, you know, other than the district that she came from. And that was a good example of how our conviction was so strong and she really didn't receive the honor that she was doing until later in life and after death. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And just that she led for, like she went first, right? And I love that whole idea. I love that just even quote, like I'll go first. And that often it is a, it is a costly move because often people in the moment are not acknowledged. In fact, they're persecuted for going first. That's more the story. I mean, when you step out, there's a lot of fear there because rightfully so because it takes that kind of courage because going first is hard. Um, you know, and as we're talking about Alex's book and just this idea that um, when, we're, when we're acting out of moral courage, we are seeking what is true and praiseworthy and excellent. And, you know, those things and how, how that may lead us to places that are uncomfortable, but how do you see that fueling those uncomfortable places and actually supporting um, those actions in a way that um, fuels your, I'm not saying this very well, but where, where it fuels what you're doing. And then also how that continues to motivate you as those kind of spiral and play off of one another. Yeah, doing good and doing the right thing, there is always going to be a positive consequence and something that um, my father really instilled in me that Oftentimes, you know, we talk about integrity um, and that really being what you do even when nobody's looking. Well, there's also consequences of your actions. There's consequences of, of sin um, that sometimes are not immediate. There are consequences of doing good. And sometimes those aren't immediate as well. We, we will see people in heaven that we never saw actually come to the Lord maybe in our lifetime. There are going to be people who um, experience redemption and economic breakthrough later on in life that you might never see mm. when you are the one actually serving and walking alongside them in their poverty. Uh, there are people who are going to be uh, stable, loving families, free from addiction, so on and so on, maybe down the line as a consequence of your goodness that you might never see right now. And I think we need to start thinking uh, with an eternity mindset, something very, very difficult uh, that many of us uh, in a Western wealthy, um, especially in this time span, this microwave culture where we're used to getting things now and seeing results mm -hmm. now, um, we, you know, we really have to play the long game. And um, I was also uh, served on the Virginia State Board of Social Services uh, for four years, which oversees um, the Department of Social Services and many of the anti-poverty programs. And during my time, we looked at data all the time the charities and the organizations that played sort of a long game with helping people come out of poverty were the most successful one. Oftentimes, it's very difficult to help folks come out of poverty in a short time period. Mm -hmm. It may take three years. And are you willing to walk alongside people during that rocky path? And I think that we as followers of Jesus need to be willing to do that because he did that. Um, but also when we're talking about uh, people and their issues and how they work, no two people are the same. And we need to be able to play the long game to see the consequences of your goodness play out in the future. Mm, well, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> it just, it's... Um... DJ, you speak to my heart and you speak to my mind and you speak to my life in so many ways. Um... Yes, the ministry that my husband runs, it's transitional housing for people coming out mostly of addiction oh. and domestic violence. And they live in their properties for five years, 10 years. Like this is not, this is a invest deep kind of work, not a, the, there is room for both in the world of ministry, the immediate need, but then there's the long-term change. And you have to be willing to go deep and long for uh, generational change. And um, so I, I very much agree. Uh, yeah. Okay, as we uh, wrap up, which it's kind of killing me that we have to wrap up, uh, what encouragement would you have for our listeners that are wanting to see good, 
maybe in the public square, maybe just in, with their neighbors and are having a hard time finding the good in the middle of the headlines. What encouragement yeah. do you have? Well, first of all, I want to say that I understand uh, where many people's frustrations are coming from and coming out of the pandemic. I think it's important for us all to realize that the forces of the pandemic and the isolation actually pulled us further apart in a lot of different ways. We, many of us were not able to be present in a lot of physical gatherings that we normally would have. We were not able to work with other people. We weren't able to go to church. And so oftentimes, whatever your bubble is or was, oftentimes it was with people who thought like you. It was people who shared the same values. And through that, I think um, we, we kind of create, created a situation where we aren't rubbing shoulders with people who are different than us, uh, racially, ideologically, religiously, the list goes on and on. And so um, that contributed to the divisiveness that we're experiencing today. And I think it's important for Christians to realize that. Uh, and we need to get to the point where we're back re-engaging with people who are different than us. Uh, who think differently about the vaccines, who think differently about politics, who think differently about race, because it will help us to, to grow ourselves and stretch us and cause us to think differently than we may have thought of before. But if you are a follower of Jesus, you're supposed to be serving your neighbors and loving your neighbors anyway. You're supposed to be loving those people who think differently than you, who voted differently than you in the last election. Um, the, the Bible doesn't say uh, in Galatians 6, 2 to, to carry each other's burdens. It doesn't, you know, talk about how you're supposed to, the, the two greatest commandments, by the way, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two greatest of commandments. And if you look at many of our friends and Christians' Facebook feeds, you may be thinking, do they know the second <laughs> commandment there? <laughs> Um, so I just want to say it's been a tough period, but we have the unique opportunity now to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to display his love in a way that will stand out even more. I mean, just think about it. If you engaged in your communities and in your churches with people who thought differently with Jesus's love, it's going to stand out even more. People are going to be like, what? what? Chris, Chris is loving that person. Chris is talking to that person. Alexandria is hanging out with who, what? And so <laughs> it's a great opportunity for the body of Christ and those who are followers of Jesus. And I just want to encourage you to think about that. Uh, and then lastly, I just want to encourage you again with politics and what you see in Washington, D.C. It's, uh, it's a very divisive time period. But uh, Washington, D.C. is a reflection of the country. Washington, D.C. is a reflection of your state. Uh, Washington, D.C. is a reflection of your congressional district or your, your metropolitan area. And so if we want to change the, the noise that we see, um, it starts where we live, even in our own neighborhoods. So just think about the people in your own neighborhood mm -hmm. that you really don't want to visit, that you really don't want to say hi to when you go to the mailbox. Um, think about your frustrations in Washington, D.C. and not think about how you can start to model a healthy, loving civility where you live. So hopefully we create a movement of civility and love that will bubble up throughout your community and eventually um, put more pressure on our elected officials to do the same. And that will eventually change the leadership that we have in our country. Mm. Thank you, DJ. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and thank your parents, because I even think, you know, here you are such a force of good in the world. And, you know, what maybe to them at age 17 felt like a really desperate situation that was so hard. And yet, like, how beautiful to see the good, right? And that it, it's just, so thank your parents and you are such a voice of good in the world. We are so grateful for your voice and it really is such a joy to have it amplified here on the podcast today. Thank you for being with us. It really is an honor to hang out with you guys. Thank you for the invitation. Bye.